Good day. Our question for today is, what was the intellectual situation that the 17th century philosophers were confronting? Because this question will really set up the beginning of modern philosophy for us. Now to do this, however, we have to review something about late medieval philosophy, which was the context in which modern philosophy began. Unfortunately, to do that, we have to go all the way back to Aristotle and ancient Greek philosophy. Having done so, we'll briefly examine the great changes that motivated modern philosophy, most of all, the revolution, scientific revolution of the 17th century, and what problems it left for philosophers to solve. Now, we cannot separate the changes in philosophy from the monumental changes in Western society at that time. Medieval Europe, we have to remember, was a collection of feudal states locally ruled by landed aristocrats, populated by vast numbers of illiterate peasants, and dimpled by a small number of towns with merchants. The only literate members of society were essentially priests. Philosophy was done by priests, members of divine orders, in the great universities of the largest cities. After the 13th century, one philosophical school of thought became so widespread among the major universities that it simply came to be called scholasticism, meaning the philosophy of the schools. Scholasticism was based in Aristotle's logic and metaphysics. To understand scholasticism, we have to begin by understanding something about Aristotle. Now, to understand Aristotle's metaphysics, we can begin with a question. What is there in the room, the car, the train, the plane, or the backyard that you're now in? Just take an inventory, a little imaginative in inventory. You may be surrounded by, if I asked you what is there, what exists in this room or in this space, you might label things like, well, there's tables, there's seats, there's people, there's books, coffee cups, electric wires, other people, furnitures, etc. There's some list of those things. Now, if I asked you to list those things in your immediate space, I wager that your list will look a lot like that one, only a little more detailed. Some smart cookie out there might mention not only are there books, but there are pages of books. Not only are there chairs, but chair legs. And then some ethereal type might well mention, well, there's also light and air. But in fact, in all such lists, much has been left out. There's a lot more, say, in this room. There are colors in this room. Uh, there is standing. There is breathing. There is listening. There's the directions right, left, up, down, before and after. That is, there are relations, activities, and properties of things, not just things that are present. Your list of things is not wrong, however. It means that you are thinking like a good Aristotelian. All realities, including properties, relations, and activities, are beings, or in Greek, Aristotle's Greek, ousia, simply meant beings. Aristotle divided all the things that are, in any sense of the word are, into ten logical categories. And it included things like the properties things have, activities, etc. But, out of all these ten categories of whatever is, in any sense of the word, is, out of all of them, one is primary. Aristotle gives priority to one of the ten. That one type of being, which is primary, are for him relatively independent physical objects. In fact, tables, chairs, peoples, books, the kinds of things you mentioned in your imaginative list. The other nine categories of being are then understood by Aristotle to belong to and be properties of or predicated of those basic things. This most basic kind of thing is parousia in Greek, or primary being, and in its familiar Latinized form, primary substance. For Aristotle, substances exist in the fullest sense of the word exist. The dog has being, let's say my pet dog is here, that dog has being in a fuller sense than its color or its posture or its activity. The color, the posture, or the activity are properties of the dog. 
The dog is not a property of the color, the activity, or the posture. We say the dog is brown. We don't say brownness has a dog under it. We say the woman is sitting. We don't say sitting is instantiated in the woman. You'll notice this has to do with the subject and predicate form of language. Aristotle's distinguishing what the subjects of our sentences ought to be from the predicates or properties we say about them. So the way to look at this is simply that Aristotle takes all the various features and characteristics of an environment and sees them as localized into, as properties of one particular kind of thing in that environment, the substances. Now, the technical definition of substance is as follows. A substance contains parts, but is not a part of anything. And properties are predicated of it, but it is not predicated of anything. So once again, it's natural to say the tree is tall, but not tallness is instantiated in the tree. The tree is the subject of the sentence. Tallness is a predicate of it. OK. Understood in this way, substance underlies or supports its properties. Hence, Aristotle sometimes referred to substance as hypokaimenon in Greek, which means the underlying. In practice, this meant that every independently existing physical object is for Aristotle, or was for Aristotle, a primary substance. I'm a primary substance, the lectern is a primary substance, my tie is a primary substance, etc. Substance became, this humble little term substance, became the most important metaphysical term for 2,300 years after Aristotle. For it meant the entity in question was independently existent. It exists as fully as anything does, and it contains its own qualitatively distinct principle of intelligibility, which explains its properties and its motions. It has a nature for Aristotle in a qualitative and explanatory sense. So what Aristotle would do, typically do in his philosophy and in his scientific work would be to, let's say, here Cahoon, Lawrence Cahoon is one substance, a primary substance. We now need to figure out the essence or nature of Cahoon. And he would give a set of definitions of what makes me Cahoon. Now, in general, Aristotle is also famous for having split the difference between various earlier philosophers, earlier Greek philosophers, people like Plato, who believed that the ultimate nature of all things are ideal forms that are not physical at all, kind of like mathematical shapes or mathematical objects, and other philosophers like the atomists, who said that everything's control, con, um, constituted by little bits of material stuff, little atoms. What Aristotle said and said is, instead is, you're both right. Any substance, again, like Cahoon is a substance or the lectern is a substance, any substance must have both form and matter. It must have material stuff out of which it's made, and it must have a structure or organization or essence that makes it what it is. It's got to have both. In fact, Aristotle generalized this to a very famous doctrine of his, his doctrine of the four causes. Every substance must have four causes, not one. There's four different things which are responsible for the existence of any one primary substance. The substances, are, the causes are the material, the efficient, the formal, and the final. Just very briefly, if we take a ship in the harbor, let's say, outside of Athens, what are the four causes of the ship? Well, one is material. The wood, the nails, the canvas, the ropes. Without them, there's no ship. But suppose I take the canvas, the ropes, all that material, throw it on the dock. Do I have a ship yet? No, because it's not in the shape of a ship. It's not in the form of a ship. So there's the matter of the substance. Then there's the form, which we can take to be the, the structural organization of all those pieces of matter. But suppose I put on the dock, I have my ship mass, and we've got wood, and we've got nails, and they're laying on the dock. We know that's not a ship yet. Suppose I come along with the blueprint and drop the blueprint on top. Is that a ship yet? No, 
because we need an efficient cause, which is the activity that leads to the matter and form being brought together. So the efficient, someone actually has to build the ship. So the act of building is the efficient cause. We need one more cause that was very important, will have a major role in uh, what we do in the next few lectures. Aristotle said, everything also has a final cause. The final cause is the goal or purpose of a thing. If you tried to put the Greek most carefully, you would say it's the towards which of a thing. Now this doesn't, goal or final cause does not have to be an explicit idea. The ship's final cause is that we're going to sail it, let's say, for trading purposes. But uh, what's the final cause of an acorn? It's to become an oak tree. What's the final cause of a rock? Well, it's really just to lay on the surface of the earth. So the final causes are not all uh, elaborate purposes. Okay. Now, although he worked in every field, the closest to Aristotle's heart was arguably biology. Living things for Aristotle have what he called suke. The Greek word suke, from which we get psychology, is really just what it meant for the Greeks was essentially soul. Now, their conception of soul is not like, let's say, the modern Christian notion of soul. It's not an eternal, uh, ongoing, non-physical essence. Rather, by suke or soul, the Greeks merely meant the animating principle and it, what makes something alive. And Aristotle took that quite literally. That is, for Aristotle, there are three levels of soul. There's the vegetative soul, characteristic of plants. And for him, this is, simply means that plants have in them a level of suke or soul, which is responsible for the most basic activities of life, like metabolism, growth, nutrition, etc. Animals, according to Aristotle, have a higher level of soul, characteristic of animal life, a moving, sensitive, passionate soul. They move around. They have perceptions of the world, they have desires, they have fear, they pursue prey. That's the animal level of soul. Lastly, human beings have a yet higher level of soul. That's the rational soul, because we can rationally think and speak. What's important to remember is, in this developmental model of Aristotle's, which is rather sophisticated, each higher level organism retains the lower level of soul along with its higher level. In other words, in a human being, I still have a vegetative soul in me because I have to digest my food, grow, I have autonomic functions, my breathing, my heart rate are all managed automatically. That's the vegetative level. I then have my emotional, perceptual, instinctual level of soul. And then finally, I have my rational or abstract, Ab the feature of my suke, which is responsible for abstract thought and for speech. And those are always linked for Aristotle. Now, the aim of Aristotelian science was famously to classify all types of qualitatively different substances, to define them, relate them, and delineate their causes. Aristotle's physics was combined by other ancients with the Ptolemy's geocentric system of the universe. This was a picture common in ancient Greece and Rome, of the universe as a closed system. Space is finite, not infinite. The Earth is at the center, that's why it's geocentric. The moon is the super earthly object which is closest. Everything under the orbit of the moon, everything sublunar, which is the Earth, is made of the four classic elements. These were not developed by philosophers, but these were the common ways that the Greeks thought about the material elements of the world, namely air, earth, uh, water, and fire. So everything on earth is somehow composed of a combination of air, water, earth, and fire. But the moon, and then all the planets and stars beyond them, it was believed, had to be made of a much more refined substance called ether. Okay? And the planets and the, uh, ultimately the stars rotated around the Earth in a closed and rather cozy picture of the universe. Now, 
Medieval scholasticism integrated Aristotle with Christianity and with a certain amount of Platonism and even Neoplatonism, the latter being the work of the ancient Greek philosopher Plotinus. But the key fact to remember here is this. Scholasticism is essentially Aristotle plus Christianity. The medieval scholastics, they had their religion, they had an elaborate Christian theology, but what they didn't have in their religious thought was an elaborate, complex theory of nature in the natural world. So philosophers in the 13th century tried to merge the two. Now there were problems with this fit. For example, if you just think about it, in Aristotle there is no immortal soul. Aristotle was a pagan uh, living uh, several hundred years before Christ. Uh, the Greeks were polytheists, believed in many little gods, not one all-powerful eternal god. Uh, from Aristotle's point of view, there is no immortal soul. Clearly, you'd have to change that if you're a Christian and you're incorporating your Aristotle into your re Christian religion. However, in many other respects, the fit was remarkably good. And the most famous synthesizer of these two views was St. Thomas Aquinas. His views, his uh, philosophical work was originally condemned by the Catholic Church, but until years later, it became official church doctrine. So, in this new synthesis that Aquinas produced, and many other philosophers at that time uh, disagreed with Aquinas on particulars, but still accepted this big system that he put together, and this became scholasticism. In this view, once again, the universe is a closed system, cozy, with the earth at the center. Everything in it is a primary substance with properties. Everything in it has a final cause, which partly determines what it is and what it's for. And of course, the doctrine of final cause from Aristotle's non-Christian Greek philosophy fits beautifully with Christianity, because now you can just say, where does an entity get its final cause? God gives it its final cause. So everything in the universe is fitting together. All the purposes of all the substances in the universe fit together to serve God's plan for the whole. Okay. But note, I should just say, it's not true, as it is often said, that the pre-modern universe gave humanity a privileged place at the center of things. For from scholasticism's viewpoint, the center of the universe, where the earth was put, is the lowest place. And of course, it was typical of classical Christianity to have a doctrine of sin. The earth is not the best place to be in the universe. It's the lowest place. All right. Now, many social changes contributed to the decline of the scholastic worldview once we got into the, especially the 15th and 16th centuries. First, you might say the discovery of the New World in 1492. That discovery meant that the Earth was not only much bigger than previously thought, but much more complicated. Perhaps more important was the Protestant Reformation of 1516. Since the fall of the Roman Empire and until 1516, virtually every person you could ever meet in Central or Western Europe was a Roman Catholic, with small pockets of Jews and Muslims in various places. The Protestant Revolution ended all, Reformation ended all of that. At the same time, there is the long-term decline of the aristocracy and the concomitant rise of ro royal power and the middle or commercial class. Uh, I might just say, uh, in the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages were not the period of great royal power. In the Middle Ages, the power of the king is, was often described as primus inter pares in Latin, first among equals, meaning that the king has just a little more power than those powerful landed nobles, the aristocrats, and he only holds that power as long as he keeps them in line and satisfies enough of them. Okay? The feudal system is a decentralized system, but over time, for economic reasons and for political reasons, as time went on, the aristocracies began to lose their power and the power of the king increased. And in the modern period, that 
also usually went together with the rise of a middle class which made its money on trading and so an entire nation state began to evolve in which there's a king at the top and the trading classes wind up making more money and more taxes to feed the king. At any rate, the decline of the aristocracy was an important factor, but that took centuries. But above all, the most important factor was the scientific revolution of Copernicus, Bacon, Kepler, Galileo, Bruno, and Newton. For this had the effect of undermining the Aristotelian view of the natural world that scholasticism has adopted as its own. In other words, Aquinas took his Christianity and Christian theology and he took Aristotle's theory of nature. He wove them together. That functioned quite well. The scientific revolution came along and started attacking not Christianity, but attacking the Aristotelianism. But the Aristotelianism by now was woven together. So any attack on Aristotle came to be viewed as an attack on the whole thing, including religion. And that was what was dangerous about the scientific revolution. Now, it came in stages. First came the 1543 publication of Copernicus's On the Revolution of Celestial Spheres. And in this book, Copernicus famously argued for the heliocentric system, which put the Earth in motion and the Sun at the center of the universe. You should mention Copernicus was not the first person to think of this, but Copernicus made the most convincing mathematical case for its validity. But now Copernicus could show that a heliocentric model was mathematically simpler than the mass of epicycles and complications that had been necessary to fudge the old geocentric Ptolemaic system into harmony with ever increasingly, with increasingly accurate observations. Copernicus only applied his work to our solar system, you should note. Copernicus did not apply it to the universe. But later thinkers like Giordano Bruno speculated, that is other members of the scientific revolution that came a little after Copernicus, took it much further. Bruno speculated wildly that space was infinite Meaning, not only was the Earth not at the center of the universe, but there's no center at all. If, there's, if space is infinite, it doesn't have a center. Bruno also speculated that if that's true, if there's an infinity of space, there must be an infinity of planets. If there's an infinity of planets, there must be an infinity of inhabited planets. And if there's an infinity of inhabited planets, there must be an infinity of planets with ensouled beings like humans. In other words, other planets with, with um, uh, human life and human souls. Uh, for this level of speculation, he was burnt at the stake. Galileo, who supported the Copernican system, introduced a new science of mechanics, of matter in motion, understood to interact through material and efficient causes without reliance on what were called substantial forms or final causes. Substantial forms just means Aristotle's old notion that for anything, there is a qualitative essence that makes it what it is. That's the formal cause. And the final cause, of, co of course, is its purpose. The new science of mechanics, initiated most prominently by Galileo, drops any reference to substantial forms or final causes and rests its case on uniform motion and rest being dynamically equivalent, each being the result of zero net force, which is a particularly counterintuitive idea. That is, the notion that, uh, from Aristotle's point of view, uh, force and velocity were, had to be proportional. When the cart is sitting there with no horses pulling it, force is zero, velocity is zero. When we put horses on it and they start to pull, now there's force, so there's velocity. But Galileo, as we know, took a very different view. And all of modern science began with the view that acceleration is proportional to force, that dynamically speaking, in terms of the forces operating, when you have a situation where there are two there's an object moving, uh, when there's an object at rest, 
and an object moving with uniform velocity in a straight line, for example, in a vacuum, those two cases are dynamically equivalent. In other words, there's, both, there's zero net force acting on both. This was a very counterintuitive idea, but it was the basis for the beginning of modern mechanics. Now, Galileo, as we know, got into trouble. He ridiculed the Pope in one of his publications and ended his days under house arrest. His elimination of, fin of final causes in substantial forms, though, was quite crucial. Because in effect, Galileo said, the explanation of the motion of a body does not depend on its nature. It depends on its mass, it depends on its uh, shape, but it doesn't depend on what kind of thing it is. Aristotle's qualitatively distinctive substantial forms don't matter anymore. Lastly came Newton in his epoch marking mathematical principles of natural philosophy of 1687. This showed that the, the laws of motion of everyday objects in the world and the gravitational forces that controlled the movements of planets and stars were the same, operating under a single set of force laws. With one blow, Newton had destroyed the division between the sublunar and the superlunar realm. Now notice once again that this conflict that the new science introduces is not between the New Testament and the new science. The New Testament and the new science, with some exceptions, are pretty much two ships passing in the night. They don't have an argument with each other. The argument is because Aristotelian scholasticism had over three centuries been adopted by the church as the theory of nature most compatible with Christian theology. It's the fact that they had been fitted together by people like Aquinas that makes the new science a threat. Also notice one thing. The new science, despite most people's uh, intuitive guesses, the new science is in some ways rather more platonic than Aristotelian. And here we might think of a marvelous old painting, one of the greatest paintings uh, with philosophers as its subject, Raphael's The School of Athens. In Raphael's School of Athens, we see many figures, actually figures from ancient Greek thought, uh, sitting around the steps of an enormous uh, uh, stadium. And uh, what dominates the picture is in the center of the painting, there, is, uh, there are the figures of Plato and Aristotle. And Plato's figure, he's holding a copy of one of his books, the Timaeus, and with his other hand, he is pointing upward. Aristotle's figure, he's also holding a book, but in his other hand, he has his other hand stretched, palm open, palm down, and in a very simplistic way, but not an accurate way, this characterizes the difference between their philosophies. Plato believes not that this world is an illusion, but he believes it's only made intelligible by reference to the ideal forms which lie behind it, which are the true realities. Aristotle believes instead these physical substances that we interact with are the true reality. Okay? Well, you might imagine that modern science would be Aristotelian because it's not concerned with another world, it's concerned with our empirical knowledge of this world. Well, there's definitely something to be said for that. Aristotle said all knowledge comes through the senses. That's partly true. But look at what Galileo and Copernicus and Newton and others were saying. They were saying that the only way to understand these objects in this world is to turn away from your experience of them, from how they look day to day, and instead pay attention to an ideal mathematical reconstruction of those objects. Okay? So Plato had been highly uh, inspired by mathematics regarded it as the high, almost the highest form of knowledge. Um, and from Plato's point of view, for example, if all triangular shaped objects cease to exist today, does that mean that geometric entity triangle would cease to be? No, there would still be triangles, there just wouldn't be any yield signs, there wouldn't be any triangular shaped objects. From the point of view of the new science, unlike Aristotle, 
which was the new science being explicitly mathematical, which Aristotle science was not. Aristotle didn't think that mathematics was much use in terms of understanding the nature of, the nature of things. But the new science is ex exclusively mathematical. It describes just a few quantitative properties of a few objects and tries to find rules like mass, velocity, momentum that relate them to each other. While, ma while modern science does indeed depend on experimentation, it does not respect the unaided experience of the senses. After all, and this is what uh, opponents of the Copernican hypothesis said against Copernicus, they said, we don't feel the earth move. If the earth were turning at the rate you say it should, we ought to feel it, but we don't. Okay. Galileo and Copernicus had to say, those sensory experiences of yours by which you don't feel the earth move are misleading. In fact, Galileo himself wrote approvingly that in the Copernican theory, reason had made what Galileo said was a rape of the senses. That modern science does not accord with our unaided senses. It accords with a mathematical theory of potentially unobservable entities that explain our sense experience. In other words, the new platonic but experimental science replaced the Aristotelian qualitative and purpose of science that had become integrated with Christian thought. Now this leaves a grave problem. How are we to make the new science compatible with religion and the soul and the human mind and freedom and morality? For the new science is claiming that the universe is a set of material objects, maybe made out of tiny atoms, maybe larger objects, which move according to mechanical laws of motion. If that's true of the lectern and of the earth and of the moon, it must be true of me as well. But what does that have to say about my mind, my freedom, my morality, and my soul? Thank you.